Yeah, yeah, that's right. That so, may not be of interest to them. It is, it is better to mute it, I think. Yeah, I think, yeah, it's better. And hopefully, Satya will get back uh, soon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, I'm locally recording it. Uh, okay. I will have to see why this particular problem, but uh, let us now get it going. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, you all can hear me. Uh, so, good evening. Uh, this is uh, the fourth a lecture in this uh, outreach, uh, I know outreach series. Uh, today's talk is going to be uh, by Professor Vivek Dathar, uh, the project director of the I know project from DIFR Mumbai. Uh, Professor Dathar is a senior professor at the DIFR. Uh, since uh, May 2015, he obtained uh, his PhD from the University of Mumbai way back in 1983 and uh, did uh, postdoctoral work at uh, IPN Orsay, France, as well as uh, Stony Brook uh, in USA. Uh, before moving to TIFR, he was at the NPD, Nuclear Physics Division, BRC, uh, from 1975 to 2015, that is. Uh, he was also a prof senior professor at the uh, Omi Baba National Institute, HBNI, and he was actually dean academic uh, in physical and mathematical sciences, BRC during that time. He was also the head of nuclear physics division and as well as an adjunct professor at School of Natural Sciences DIFR. That is even before he joined formally to DIFR. His areas of uh, interest, research interest include low energy nuclear physics, tests of conservation laws and symmetries, and of course, neutrino physics. Presently, as I said, he is the project director of India-based neutrino observatory project. Uh, which, uh, of course, he would again dwell upon in detail, uh, which aims to build a large underground laboratory uh, near Madurai in Tamil Nadu. Okay. Uh, with those few words, uh, now I request uh, Professor Dathar uh, to start his lecture, but uh, let me um, share the screen. Yeah. yeah. Uh, can you see the screen, sir? Now. Yeah. 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 I can see. The, oh. So the only problem now will be that I will not be able to uh, uh, increase the slides. I mean, uh, go slide by slide. I'll have yeah. to. Uh, yeah. Take your help. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Not a okay, problem. So thanks, Satya, for the kind introduction. But uh, the uh, I'm not going to talk about the Ino project in this talk. I think I'll leave that for another talk. And in this talk, I only propose to uh, tell. Uh, what is the neutrino and what are the sources, what are his basic properties that may be some of the open problems. Uh, I will not go into INO at all. Uh, maybe, as I said, at, uh, in some other talk subsequently. So we should keep something for the future uh, so the series goes on for some time till the lockdown uh, stops. Okay, so this is the plan of my talk. What is a neutrino? Uh, what are the sources of neutrinos and how do we detect neutrinos? Uh, some basic properties of neutrinos and measurements associated with those. Uh, a little bit about neutrino oscillations. Just uh, last Monday, we had a talk on neutrino oscillations specifically by Deepak Samuel. Uh, so, but this is a very brief, there are hardly three, uh, two, three slides on that. And uh, some open problems. Again, some open problems, not all. Okay, so next slide. Uh, Satya, can you hear me? Yes, yes, I went to yeah, so, Okay, so next slide. Okay, so what is a neutrino? A neutrino is a fundamental particle like the electron. Okay? Just as the electron uh, is a fundamental particle, it forms, it is part of the atom, uh, so is a neutrino. Uh, okay, I think some part of the slide is cut, in my screen at least, but maybe it shows on other screens, is it? Uh, yeah. The bottom part of the slide seems to be a little cut. But that uh, bottom part is uh, three kinds of neutrinos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the e mu tau is cut in half. Okay. Oh. Well, I, that's in my screen, perhaps. Maybe not in everybody's screen. Yes, yes. Is that right? Not in, not in my screen. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Fine. So this is to do with my screen. Whether I can try to reduce it. No, it doesn't help. Okay. So uh, it's not part of the atom. It is, uh, however, it is created in processes like beta decay, pion decay, muon decay, and so on. And it's a stable particle. I should have mentioned that here. It's a 
uh, as far as we know it is uh, a very long lifetime it has no electric charge which makes it of course difficult to detect but another remarkable thing about it is that it's about a million times lighter than the electron so rhines once said uh, that you know this is the tiniest piece of matter uh, as far as we know again it's a point particle like the electron but it also has a extremely small mass uh, in the region perhaps of milli electron volts it interacts only through two ways namely of course everything interacts gravitationally energy mass attracts gravitational as we all know but uh, the only other interaction it has is the weak interaction it doesn't interact strongly nor does it interact through the electromagnetic interaction uh, now of course if we discover that the neutrino has a small uh, magnetic dipole moment then this will change then this will also interact uh, through the electromagnetic but as of now uh, there are only upper bounds on the magnetic moment m1 moment of the neutrino since it interacts only very feebly of the order of about uh, typically for a mev electron and a mev neutrino the interactions uh, strengths are of the order of uh, 10 to the minus 14 or so so uh, electron interacts 10 to the 12 to the 14 times stronger than a neutrino that's that makes it very difficult to detect but that also brings with it some advantages that it can penetrate matter it doesn't interact uh, very much is the second most abundant particle in the universe after of course the most abundant which is uh, all familiar photon and uh, just give you a rough scale of how abundant it is Uh, apart from the number which is there 330 per centimeter cube of that order uh, it's about a billion times more uh, numerous in, in the universe than the familiar electron uh, of course you, you know that uh, n uh, the baryon number to photon number is about 10 to the minus 9 and this is this is of course how it happens that the, uh, the number of protons is the same as the number of electrons because the universe is electrically neutral on the whole and therefore uh, this is the fraction of uh, uh, the electron fraction is only a billion times smaller than the neutrino there are three kinds of neutrinos as far as we know uh, the electron type muon type and the tau type and they have their partners among the charged leptons which i will come to in the next slide the electron muon and tau part okay next slide so the uh, our knowledge of elementary particles is summarized in this This is a, uh, I've given the place where I've taken this figure from. Uh, so all that we know of, uh, apart from the dark matter and dark energy, the uh, visible matter is composed of uh, quarks and leptons, and then the force corresponding force carriers. Of course, apart from the Higgs boson, which was discovered in 2012. So the uh, familiar quarks that we have is the U and D quark, which make up the uh, proton and the neutron. So Two U's and one D make up a proton, and one, two D's and one U make up a neutron. Okay? Uh, and of course, we have the electron here, uh, which is in this first family of particles, and the corresponding electron type of neutrino. Then there are other heavier families, so the charmed quark and the strange quark. Uh, this uh, the, the quark sector, the uh, the upper side has uh, the particles have plus two thirds charge. the lower ones have minus 1/3 charge and of course it is opposite for the their anti particles so there is a corresponding to a u there is a u bar and d b bar and so on in the case similarly in the case of lepton the electron uh, is negatively charged but then it has a partner anti particle partner which has a positive charge and the same goes for muon and tau particles uh, on the other hand of course the neutrinos have uh, no electric charge so however they have uh, they said there are partners of the muon the you know, mu mu and the tau uh, lepton which has a new tau uh, the forces between these particles are uh, the, the force carriers uh, which are responsible for the forces between these particles in the case of the strong interaction is the gluon uh, and we are all yeah. familiar with the is there a feedback some how to add why is there a feedback i am getting a feedback Uh, so the, uh, some problem. Yeah, there is some, some problem. I think there is a. Uh, just let me check one minute, sir. Yeah, yeah. Just, just let me check.
Uh, that must be something from your end, I guess. Here it seems okay. Okay. Uh, I've also switched off my fan, so it'll get a little hot, but uh, maybe the background noise will also reduce. Okay. Can you hear me? Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, uh, oops. One minute. One minute. One minute. Oops. Oops. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So uh, now a very unique property of these neutrinos is that uh, they start out as so-called flavor eigenstates, which means that they, they start out as uh, nu e, nu mu or nu tau, but as they propagate, uh, depending on the uh, mass component, uh, the, the velocities of these are very slightly different. Or in the wave picture, you can say that the phases uh, change differently for these different mass states. Uh, now, you might say, okay, what is this flavor in mass eigenstate? Uh, this is very similar to the, uh, let's say, if you have two coordinate frames, one rotated with respect to the other, then uh, these two frames can be connected through the so-called Euler angles in three dimensions. So similarly, in the case of uh, uh, neutrinos, you have three uh, mixing angles. Uh, so their the nomenclature is theta 1, 3, theta 1, 2, and theta 2, 3, and so on. Uh, and then there are, of course, the three mass eigenstates. In addition, because the connecting matrix is a, uh, uh, has, uh, has certain properties that it has to uh, have, uh, certain symmetries that it has to have, uh, this unitary matrix has complex elements in it. And uh, one of the things that comes about if you have to obey these symmetries is that uh, you could have a CP violating phase in that. So there is one more parameter. Now, in the case of, uh, we, we don't know whether the particle is its own antiparticle, uh, in which case, if it is its own antiparticle, then there is one more phase angle. But those are matters of detail. Uh, of course, we don't know whether there are only three families. We know that so the active uh, families of neutrinos are only three with masses less than 50 or so GeV. Uh, I'll come to that in the next slide. But there could be more families with uh, much heavier. Uh, there could also be so-called sterile neutrinos, which don't interact through the normal weak interaction, but through maybe some super weak interaction and so on. Okay, next slide. Okay, uh, we'll come to some neutrino history before I come to that. Uh, so, uh, as uh, some of you would know, the neutrino was proposed by Pauli in 1930 to uh, explain uh, certain features of the beta decay. So beta decay spectra were measured, they were continuous, and quantum mechanics had just been born at that time, so we knew that there are definite quantum states in the initial state and the final state. So how come there are uh, there is a continuous spectrum of uh, betas? So Pauli very uh, almost unwillingly uh, said that the, there should be a third particle that comes out in beta decay. So let's say a neutron decays to a proton and a beta, uh, then you should have a unique energy of uh, the beta particle because it's a so-called two-body decay. Uh, on the other hand, the continuous nature demands, uh, he said, that you should have a third particle. And that third particle cannot have charge because otherwise you would violate charge conservation. Uh, however, uh, since uh, it is uh, beta spectra were measured and they, uh, the, the end point of these agreed reasonably with the mass differences of the two nuclei concerned, it also meant that the mass of the neutrino is very tiny. So, uh, okay, so very soon, very quickly, within a few years, Fermi wrote down the quantum theory for beta decay. And uh, however, it took almost uh, more than 20 years for these to be detected. In fact, Pauli believed that it, uh, he has proposed a particle that cannot be detected. But the experimentalists proved him wrong. And uh, Reines, in, uh, Reines and Cohen and a bunch of experimenters uh, indeed uh, found evidence for the electron type of neutrino, actually the anti-electron type of neutrino at a nuclear reactor. In fact, Reines had uh, first thought of looking for these in, uh, in bomb explosions, atomic uh, explosions, uh, but of course those can't, those can't be repeated. So uh, somebody, like, I think Alvarez or Fermi suggested to him that it might be better if you look for them in reactors, and that's what he did, and uh, found evidence for this electron type. In a few years later, uh, Schwartz had proposed uh, 
looking for a, another kind of neutrino, something which is which was uh, hypothesized by a gentleman called Ponte Corvo, uh, a very famous name in neutrino and particle physics. Uh, he was actually a contemporary of Fermi, moved to Russia, and he was the director of the JINR, the equivalent of the CERN uh, lab in Europe. So he had proposed that there might be another kind of neutrino. Uh, and uh, Schwartz proposed that this uh, would be uh, this could be produced in the decay of moving ions, charged ions. So let's say you produce pi plus in high energy proton collisions with matter. And then this pi plus moves in a, uh, in a direction and then it decays while it is moving. So the neutrino goes in the forward direction. So there is so-called relativistic focusing of this. And he proposed an experiment to be done and Lederman and uh, uh, Steinberger joined uh, this. They, uh, they worked together for the, some other people also in the, uh, in the uh, paper uh, that came out, uh, the discovery paper. And in 62 at Brookhaven, uh, using the AGS synchrocyclotron, I think it was a 26 GV machine, they found evidence for the new mu. It took another about 40 years for the new tau to be discovered in the Fermi lab. Byproduct of tau decays, uh, the tau lepton decay, which had been discovered in uh, in 1975 at uh, SLAC. Now, uh, one more thing I would just like to add uh, that uh, how do we know that there are only three families of neutrinos? Okay, as I said, the uh, uh, the force carriers for the weak interactions are the neutral Z boson and the charged W plus and W minus boson. Now. Uh, beautiful series of experiments or uh, actually a program was developed at uh, the what is called large electron positron collider in sun in the 80s and that was uh, the accelerator actually was in the present lhc tunnel so that tunnel after lep was dismantled was then used for making the large hadron collider of which you many of you would know where the higgs boson was discovered so uh, the idea in this LEP machine was that you sit on the Z0 resonance. You, with a E plus and E minus coming in opposite directions, you populate the Z0 uh, boson uh, and then look for its decay in great detail. And this was done over a period of something like 10 years. And uh, the Z0 can of course decay into hadrons, it can decay into charged leptons, but it can also decay into uh, neutrals like such as neutrinos. And so that is the uh, that is the unseen particle decay of the Z0. Now, if you see the width of that particle, and if you compare it to the to the particles that are seen, uh, you can infer how much is not seen. And from that number, uh, the uh, there is a very recent uh, analysis. Actually, this 2020 is wrong. which is 2019, I think, end of 2019. Uh, this was reanalyzed uh, very interestingly through a, a better calculation of the uh, famous Baba cross section, E plus E minus cross section, and that changed things a bit. There was a previously there was a two sigma discrepancy between N mu uh, of uh, some 2.98 something and uh, a number like three, whereas now uh, with this reanalysis, it uh, within errors it agrees with this number of three. Okay, next slide. Uh, apart from the Nobel prizes for uh, the discovery of the neutrino. Uh, and uh, that means the of the uh, electron type and of the muon type of neutrinos. Uh, there have also been a couple of other uh, Nobel Prizes awarded for work on neutrino research. One is by uh, Ray Davis for the uh, solar neutrino uh, detection. And uh, Oshiba, who built the Kamiokande detector using uh, very fancy photomultiplier tubes and a huge tank of pure water. Uh, which was meant to look for uh, nucleon decay, proton decay. Uh, he found, uh, I mean, uh, what is that called? The word for that. Uh, uh, you don't anticipate that kind of discovery. He found evidence for uh, supernova neutrinos. This was in 1987. And so these, uh, the supernova goes by the name of SN 1987A. So he got, he shared the Nobel Prize for uh, measuring these supernova neutrinos. In 2015, uh, again, two people got the Nobel Prize for work on uh, neutrinos. Uh, Kajita uh, for looking at the atmospheric neutrino evidence for neutrino oscillations. And uh, Arthur McDonald, who looked at uh, the solar neutrinos 
using the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory detector uh, of uh, one uh, kiloton of heavy water. Uh, and uh, for this discovery, they uh, got the Nobel Prize. Of course, uh, as I will come to a little later, the fact that neutrinos oscillate uh, mean uh, not just that the mixing angles are uh, non-zero, uh, the relevant mixing angles, uh, but also that the mass squared differences are non-zero. If the mass squared uh, differences are uh, zero, then again oscillations won't happen. So, uh, in the two, let's say in the two neutrino uh, picture, uh, if uh, you have m2 squared minus m1 squared, which is non-zero, uh, it could be that m1 is zero, but then at least m2 is non-zero. And since the electron, muon, and tau type is a mixture of each of these, uh, then uh, effectively each of these uh, neutrinos uh, would have a finite mass. So small, perhaps. Okay, next slide. Uh, okay, now if you want to study neutrinos, of course, you have to know what are the sources of neutrinos and how you detect them. So, this slide shows what are the, I mean, at least some of the major sources of neutrinos and also, uh, I mean, very broadly, whether the flux is high or low and what are the energy scales that are involved. Uh, again, I, uh, I hope you see the last part of this slide as well. Which shows, uh, I think, blazers. Yes, sir. Sir. Huh? yes, yes. we okay. can see. Okay, okay. I, I can't see the last one. Okay, so the sun is one of the most prolific sources of neutrinos uh, on Earth. We, could be, we have about 60 billion of these uh, neutrinos of the electron type uh, passing through every square centimeter. So the tip of your finger, let's say, uh, has uh, 60 billion neutrinos passing through them uh, every second. However, uh, in a whole lifetime, probably only one will get uh, will interact with the human body. Uh, so that makes it uh, pretty safe. Neutrinos are pretty safe. Uh, the energies are low. Can you hear me? Pardon? Oh, good. I am heard. Continue. Very good. Can you please, uh, all of you, can you please mute? Can you please mute, can you please mute all of you? And also, please uh, keep your. Uh, uh, video also off at this moment. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so the other sources are listed here. <clears throat> so the sun produces basically MeV uh, neutrinos. There is of course a spectrum that indeed has been measured by some of the uh, detectors. Um, nuclear reactors, of course, a very powerful source. Indeed, they were responsible for the discovery. Particle accelerators. Uh, this was pioneered by the AGS. Uh, experiment uh, and now of course they are routinely uh, used for uh, various kinds of studies. Atmospheric neutrinos incidentally were uh, discovered by a collaboration of uh, Indian groups and uh, uh, Osaka State University and uh, Osaka City University and uh, Durham uh, way back in 1965. Uh, they actually beat uh, by a small margin. Uh, Rhinus to it. Rhinus was also wanting to discover atmospheric neutrinos. He indeed discovered them, but the paper came out about two weeks later. And uh, the, the Indian group's paper came out on the 15th of August, 1965. It's a nice date. Uh, of course, supernova neutrinos have been discovered now, uh, but we have to, of course, wait long for uh, with the present technology that we have, uh, because the, with the present size detectors, uh, we can probably only hope to detect supernova neutrinos once in 30 years or so. Then there are geoneutrinos, which tell us how much of uh, uranium thorium content is there, how much of potassium content is there, and so on in the Earth. And uh, indeed, radioactivity in the Earth contributes to about uh, half of the total uh, budget of the total heat radiated away by the Earth. Uh, th this doesn't, of course, involve the heat coming in from the sun. That's a lot more than this. But the uh, the Earth's core is hot and is radiating away heat, and uh, about half of it is coming from radioactivity. Uh, the radioactive decays, alpha chain decays of uranium and thorium, and this has been uh, measured in a two uh, couple of uh, very beautiful detectors uh, in Japan and in Italy. So the Kamland detector and the Borexino detector. Uh, of course, they have to contend with the normal background due to reactors, uh, but uh, they have managed to uh, you know, subtract that out and uh, 
fortunately the japanese groups uh, had all their reactors off after the incident uh, of the you know blow up of the reactor in uh, when was that I forget the date so they had a long period in which they could measure uh, neutrinos uh, with reactors off and so that uh, enhanced their uh, you know the confidence level of uh, detecting these new neutrinos even more uh, there are cosmic big bang neutrinos as i said uh, just as there are cosmic big bang photons and we you know in, in the 60s the nobel prize was awarded for the uh, photons uh, the microwave for uh, that cosmic microwave background uh, photon radiation detection uh, similarly there should be cosmic big bang neutrinos the only difficulty is that they are extremely low energy they are in the region of 100 uh, or so micro electron volt and uh, typically neutrino cross sections go down with energy uh, at low energies in fact at the square of the energy so although they are very numerous uh, they would be extremely hard to detect uh, as i said of course the flux is very high uh, then finally there are extremely high energy sources of new neutrinos in the universe where there are violent processes going on such as you know uh, black holes merging or you know uh, neutron stars merging with the uh, black holes and so on and uh, there are things called active galactic nuclei and uh, lasers and so on and they uh, certainly produce neutrinos and the advantage of uh, trying to measure them through neutrinos is that of course they can penetrate matter and therefore they can reach you but the photons have a much uh, larger interaction cross section so Uh, these uh, would have difficulty in reaching in fact they would get scattered and uh, so the very uh, deepest or the very farthest uh, uh, violent sources can perhaps be only detected by gravitational waves and neutrinos okay next slide okay how if you want to detect a neutrino you should know how it interacts with matter right uh, so a charged particle when it interacts with matter it produces ionization and then that ionization can further produce uh, things like scintillation and ultimately go into heat and so on so you can uh, base your detection on some of these uh, aspects you can either detect the ionization or you can detect the scintillation if the material is suitable or you can detect the heat produce you can see the rise in temperature and what not uh, however a neutrino uh, since it's electrically neutral it does none of these things so just like a, a neutron for instance which cannot be detected directly you have to detect a neutrino through secondary ways secondary methods so the neutrino has to interact either with the nucleus or with the electron uh, and uh, some of the processes are given here on the right uh, for instance a new mu can interact with a neutron to produce a mu minus and a proton a uh, new mu can interact sorry uh, yeah can interact with a proton uh, yeah, i got this wrong uh, i think i have got this wrong uh, i think new mu should have okay uh, charge is right okay new mu plus p can go to mu minus and also it can produce pions because uh, uh, you know if there is enough energy the pion can spit out a, a pion the proton can spit out a pion you can also have resonances uh, excited in this process in such a inelastic process uh, but you can also at as you increase the energy of the uh, neutrino uh, as you know the uh, particles are associated with their corresponding de broglie waves and the wavelength of the uh, particle uh, the associated uh, wave uh, with the particle that decreases in wavelength as the energy increases or its momentum increases and uh, so at higher and higher energies since the wavelength decreases you can now start looking at individual components of the nucleon and since quarks are the components of nucleons then they can scatter off quarks now and so you can have so called deep inelastic scattering so just as uh, electrons can deep inelastically scatter off a nucleon and that's how we came to find evidence for quarks in uh, nucleons so similarly the neutrinos can also deeply uh, inelastically scatter from quarks in the nucleon and then those Uh, scattered quarks can hadronize and can ultimately produce uh, uh, i mean mesons or uh, baryons and so on so this is the typical uh, graph which shows the cross section you can see that the cross section versus divided by the energy because at high energies this uh, is uh, this is becomes flat that's why it's plotted as a, uh, a sigma divided by e 
is of the order of 10 to the minus 38 square centimeter. So at about a GV, the cross section is of the order of about 10 to the minus 38 square centimeter. So compare it with the typical nucleon uh, or a strong interaction cross section, which is of the order of a barn, which is 10 to the minus 24. This is about 14 orders of magnitude smaller uh, in cross section. And therefore, uh, neutrinos are hard to detect. Next slide. Okay, this is just showing the same thing, but in a different energy scale. Uh, if you look at the higher energy part of it, you can see this curve is flattening. So uh, sigma by E is becoming more or less a constant. So that's what I said in the first time. Okay, next. Uh, there is also a, a plot at extremely high energies. And this is from a paper, uh, the reference I can't see, but it's a paper by Gandhi and company, one of our colleagues in uh, HRI, in Allahabad. So uh, what is plotted is the, uh, the cross section uh, in square centimeters uh, versus the energy of the neutrino in GeV. So you can see at very high energies, this cross section uh, goes to about four or five orders of magnitude higher than what it was at one GeV. Uh, now, on the right side, you see also a plot of the mean free path, the typical interaction distance. And now, for a 100 TeV neutrino, that means 10 to the power of 5 GeV, the uh, mean free path is of the order of the diameter of the Earth. So when we said that uh, neutrinos hardly interact, they can pass through the Earth with almost no interaction, that pertains to lower energy neutrinos. But if you talk about very high energy neutrinos, then of course they get attenuated. Uh, so the neutrino flux can uh, attenuate. Indeed at 100 TeV, uh, it, gets, it goes down if it passes through the diameter of the Earth, so a factor of one by E. Okay. Uh, in fact, this uh, property was used by a very large experiment, which I'll come to a little later, the ice cube experiment, to actually find out the amount of matter uh, that the neutrino traverses. And this was used to make, of course, uh, it's not very interesting from the accuracy point of view, but they could in fact weigh the Earth using the weak interaction. Uh, and they got it right to within about 20% with just one year of uh, the very early data, which was put up on the web. Uh, some uh, phenomenologists in Spain that did that. But uh, this can be done better. But more importantly, these could also be used for uh, tomography of the Earth. Uh, just the attenuation, just, just the way uh, X-rays are attenuated in the body or in other uh, objects, and then you can uh, try to find out what is uh, it that has attenuated the uh, X-rays. So similarly, you can within quote unquote X-ray the Earth using neutrinos. So, okay. Uh, next slide. Okay. So how do you detect neutrinos? So ultimately, you have to produce a charged particle. That's the bottom line. Uh, okay, uh, processes are given here uh, because the neutrino is, as I said, electrically neutral. So you have to detect it indirectly when it reacts with nuclei, electrons through the weak interaction. It should produce charged particles. And charged particles, we know how to detect. Uh, in nuclear physics and uh, particle physics, we have been doing that all the time. So once you produce a charged particle, then you can hang it. So uh, it interacts in two ways, as I said. It can interact through the exchange of the charged uh, W plus W minus. Uh, bosons, uh, in which case it's called a charge current interaction. So you see there are three reactions, examples of three reactions given here. The new E bar plus a proton produces a positron and a neutron. Okay, So the neutrino, anti-neutrino has gone to a positron, an anti-electron. So from an uncharged, it has gone to charge through the exchange of the uh, Z plus, uh, sorry, W plus boson. And there are a couple of other examples there. It's, However, a neutral current interaction, a neutrino just elastically scatters of the particle. So it doesn't change its charge. And so nu E plus P goes to nu E plus P. However, when it scatters of an electron, there is an additional process that can happen. The nu E can change to a E, and the E that came in when com comes out as a nu E. So there are two possibilities here. And they, uh, in quantum mechanics, we talk of these as being two amplitudes. And uh, if you cannot distinguish uh, either of them from the final state that you look at, then you, you have to add these amplitudes. So, in fact, there is an interference between these two amplitudes. Uh, the other neutral current process that was important and was used by the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory Detector was to use heavy water. Heavy water contains heavy hydrogen. Heavy hydrogen is deuterium, 
which is a uh, bound state of the neutron and the proton. And so, uh, if an uh, electron type of neutrino is incident on the deuteron, if it has enough energy, it can break up the deuteron. So, it can scatter away with a lower energy, uh, but it can break up the deuteron, produce a proton and a neutron. So, if you can detect this process somehow, then in principle, you are sensitive to not just electron type of neutrinos, but since the new mu and the new tau can also do that, you are sensitive to all of them and equally. So, uh, there's democracy in this process. Uh, on the other hand, <clears throat> the so-called solar neutrino problem uh, found that the electron type of neutrinos, uh, there was a shortage in uh, the number that was detected on the Earth. Uh, they were short by, falling short by about a factor of three. However, this uh, Sudbury Neutrino Observatory detector settled the issue because in the same detector, they don't not only detect the, the separately the electron type of neutrinos through the charge current interaction, but also the all types of neutrinos through the neutral current interaction. And they found that what was lost is recovered. And so you get a full signal in the neutral current uh, detection. So they solved the so-called uh, uh, solar neutrino problem. Okay, as I said, uh, uh, the mean free path of the atmospheric neutrino, which is of the order of a GeV, because the flux goes down as a power law. And so typically, you are, one is sensitive to about 1 to 20 GeV neutrinos in the atmospheric neutrino detectors that uh, have been built and we plan to build. Uh, so the mean free path is typically of the order of 10 to the 8 kilometers. So you need massive detectors if you want to get any signal. Uh, so if you do a quick uh, estimate, you can find that in a 51 kiloton detector, which we are uh, hoping to build uh, in INO, uh, you will only get about four events per day. On the other hand, uh, the background in this, uh, if, you, if you do it on the surface, is about 10 orders of magnitude higher. Uh, so you have to go underground. Even then you have a background which is about uh, four, uh, 10,000 times more than the signal, but there are ways of getting around that. Because you have a particular signatures, you can ask for the, uh, you can ask for these particles to be detected in a so-called inner volume. So the outer volume you dedicate as a kind of veto detector and so on. Next slide. Okay, so this is a kind of uh, summary. It's maybe it's a little too busy, but I hope that this uh, uh, presentation will be put up on the web as well. So you can take a look at it. Uh, I'll just point out a few things. There are various kinds of detectors and processes that are used. Uh, it's ultimately up to the imagination of the experimentalist. Uh, to you know, think of a suitable detector uh, or a new detector. So in the early days, for instance, Davis did his experiment with a radiochemical detector. He took cleaning fluid, which has chlorine in it, about 600 tons of it, and uh, separated out the argon that was produced as a result of new E interactions. And since uh, the two, uh, the argon is a rare gas, it was possible to do that uh, you know, very efficiently, although the numbers of these argon atoms produced were very small. Only about uh, half an atom is produced. Of course, you don't have half an atom, but the idea is that we produce only 0.5, uh, so two at, uh, one atom every two days in, uh, in the 600 ton detector that he had uh, put together uh, in, the, uh, in an underground gold mine in South Dakota. And so it was a very painstaking piece of work, uh, ran over almost 20, 25 years. And at the end of it, uh, it produced a fantastic result and evidence for uh, new phenomenon in particle physics. Okay, then there are the so-called Cherenkov detectors, which have been uh, uh, used also very widely because uh, uh, what is the Cherenkov effect? If a, a charged particle moves in a uh, refractive medium with a speed greater than that of light in that medium, so consider a, you know, a muon, let's say, is moving, uh, suppose it has energy of GeV, then it is relativistic, it's moving at speed close to that of light, only slightly smaller than that of light. However, when light moves in water, for instance, then it moves with a velocity which is about 75%. So the muon then emits uh, akin, somewhat akin to a sonic boom when a supersonic aircraft moves through the atmosphere. Uh, it emits a, a Cherenkov cone of light and that can be detected. Uh, it, uh, the Cherenkov cone uh, also tells you about the direction of the incoming particle. So it has directional information. However, the amount of light that is produced is pretty small as compared to, let's say, liquid scintillators or uh, you know, other scintillators. Uh, but it has certain advantages. Secondly, uh, you can uh, you know, make water tanks which are huge. And so the detector is rather cheap. Uh, what is expensive is the photosensor. So you have to detect this Cherenkov light. 
So that is the most expensive part. And of course, the engineering associated with that, you have to put a huge tank of water and so on. But the material itself is cheap and you can purify it to the degree that is required and so on. Okay, then there are the so-called time projection chambers, which is the modern equivalent of the cloud or bubble chamber, uh, but an electronic type of cloud chamber, you might say. Uh, what it is, is a, you know, a, a piece of gas or liquid, uh, of course, in a large quantity. Uh, and uh, a charged particle which traverses that produces ionization, but it can also produce scintillation with a suitable material. And then this ionization is collected uh, by a set of, uh, by putting in this uh, whole detector in an electric field. If you can also additionally put a magnetic field, uh, more expensive, it is done in CMS and uh, alleys and uh, so on, uh, but the detectors that uh, are being thought of for a big experiment in uh, Dune, uh, there they are right now not thinking of putting a magnetic field, but in principle you could do that. And uh, the idea is that you can get uh, uh, the position information of the ionization that is produced. So as a charged particle uh, loses energy uh, and ultimately suppose it stops in the detector, then you get the d by dx curve. So there are beautiful d by dx plots from this detector because uh, the, uh, the track of this particle, the ionization that is produced in that, that is collected uh, because of the application of this electric field in a uh, set of detectors uh, at the anode. So when the, where the electrons drift and uh, because of you know, advances in electronics and so on, you can get uh, pads which have very high resolution or you can even put uh, gas counters with wire chambers there, which have uh, resolution. So the resolutions are typically of the order of 100 micron. And so now this is an electronic, uh, as I said, uh, equivalent of the cloud chamber, because you can actually get the ionization, amount of ionization produced, and you can store all this information. Uh, of course, it's a large amount of information that you have to store, but nevertheless, all that information is there. So this is actually ideally suited for neutrino. So the, uh, the idea is that the neutrino comes in, it interacts with whatever uh, material that you have there. Usually it's uh, some rare gas like the argon, uh, either gaseous form or liquid form, a very pure form because uh, as it drifts, it should not get captured uh, by the atoms <clears throat> and get lost for the signal. Uh, it could be xenon and so on. And uh, initially small uh, TPCs were made, but now uh, the TPCs that have, uh, they have gone to you know, a few hundred tons and the present thinking is that the Dune detector will consist of four 17 kiloton detectors each, so about 68, uh, sorry, what is that? Yeah, 68 uh, kilotons of liquid argon. Uh, it has to be very pure because, as I said, the electron that drifts should not get captured. And so the purity levels are uh, of the order of a PPB uh, or uh, better. The impurities have to be less than a PPB in such large volumes. Okay. Then, of course, liquid scintillators have been used, again, right from the days of Rhinus to even present day. Uh, Kamland is a one kiloton detector. The Chinese are hoping to set up a reactor anti-neutrino experiment using a 20 kiloton scintillation detector. Uh, so, of course, they uh, these work on the principle that an ionizing particle, which is, of course, a secondary product of a neutrino interaction with the material, uh, that produces, uh, that interacts with the scintillation material, produces light, that light is captured by photosensors uh, placed on the side. <clears throat> now the sizes are given also here, uh, typically 10 to uh, 10,000 tons of that order. Uh, finally, we have this uh, calorimeter uh, where you basically detect the full energy that is deposited by those charged particles. So they can be both passive uh, as well as active. Again, they can be solid, gas, and so on. Uh, we are going to build the iron-based calorimeter. So iron is, of course, a passive uh, I mean, it doesn't detect particles as such. It provides uh, target nuclei. But then these uh, particles produce, they encounter another set of uh, material, which is a gas detector. So you can localize that uh, particle that is produced. And then again, you have iron. And so you have a, you know, a set of sandwiches of iron and uh, active detector. So passive material and active detector. And you can make pretty big things we are hoping to build something like a uh, 51 kiloton detector, but people have already built things which are of the order of five uh, kiloton or so, uh, in a similar manner uh, for accelerator experiments. So this is the mean of I'll come to that. Later. Next slide. 
okay some neutrino detectors with some pictures okay radio chemical detector for instance was the 600 dot ton cleaning fluid detector which had <coughs> c2cl4 sorry which uh, has chlorine in it and uh, one of the isotopes of chlorine which is the chlorine 37 uh, that is actually uh, interacting with neutrinos to form argon 37 which is then separated out and detected in a very low noise uh, low background uh, proportion count that is what davis did uh, long time uh, subsequently in the 80s there was also a gallium detector between uh, i think a few tens of tons to finally it became a 100 ton detector when both the galax and sage combined uh, but this was a uh, detector which uh, looked at germanium radioactive germanium so uh, gallium has 69 gallium and 71 gallium the 71 gallium can interact with the neutrino with a pretty low energy threshold much lower than uh, for the chlorine detector so it can also detect the pp neutrinos which are uh, which end at 420 kv which cannot uh, trigger the chlorine reaction so they uh, they had a part of the signal coming from the pp neutrinos as well and uh, so they they found evidence for pp neutrinos as well of course, the solar neutrino problem was there and uh, they also found the shortage of uh, overall. Uh, so these are the two radiochemical detectors. Then there is a water Cherenkov detector uh, of uh, <clears throat> the super Kamiokande, uh, which actually hoped to look for nucleon decay, didn't find nucleon decay, but the background in that detector became the signal and they made beautiful measurements on neutrino oscillations using atmospheric. Then I already have said something about the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory Detector. Uh, that is a heavy water uh, detector. Uh, not only Cherenkov, but also uh, it detected neutrons produced uh, in the breakup of deuterium. So they had also uh, many runs, uh, various uh, you know, improvements. Fin the final run had helium-3 counters placed to detect these uh, neutrons produced in neutrino interactions. And then there is, of course, another huge Cherenkov detector called the ice cube, which is situated in the South Pole. Very harsh and uh, difficult environment to work. It was actually proposed by a, a, a theorist in Wisconsin. Uh, why not go to South Pole? Because you have very uh, transparent ice uh, in Antarctica and uh, you have uh, kilometers of ice. So they uh, put together a detector basically by putting large photomultiplier tubes and sinking them in the ice, which was very clear at uh, you know, at uh, depths, I think beyond a few tens of meters, the ice becomes very transparent. And that was uh, very beneficial for this experiment. So they started out, I think it's something like uh, uh, half or a little more than half kilometer to about one and a half or two kilometers. And they formed, a, uh, they looked at a volume which is about a one kilometer cube volume. So it was a gigaton detector as, for instance, just for comparison, the super Kamiokande detector uh, was about a 50 kiloton detector about 50 meter 45 meters or so in diameter 45 meters in height but this was about a kilometer okay next slide so some more neutrino detectors liquid scintillator detectors Kamland is a one kiloton liquid scintillator detector and borexino is one of the most uh, is even purer than Kamland in terms of uh, the purities that are there uh, it has something like i think if i remember right 10 to the minus 19 parts of uranium or thorium to one part of scintillator. One of the purest scintillators in the world. And in fact, this was proposed by Indian origin scientists called Raju Raghavan. He was in fact from the second batch of the BRC training school. Uh, he was a TIFR, then he left, uh, went abroad. He was in Bell Labs for a long time. And then uh, he had a chair in uh, Zenetech. So he proposed this and he had patented also this uh, liquid scintillator. Uh, it was made basically from uh, you know, hydrocarbons uh, which are deep underground and that's why they don't get affected by uh, I mean they have not been affected by cosmic rays and so on the carbon protein content is relatively much less uh, and uh, so if they are old enough sources of oil then you have uh, you know, very low sodium content and carbon protein content is made use of uh, you can uh, there are also magnetized iron calorimeters the ones which uh, have worked was the Accelerator-based experiment called MINOS, uh, where Fermi, uh, neutrinos produced in Fermilab were sent to a mine called Sudan Mine in Minnesota, about 750 kilometers away. And these made measurements of mixing angles of neutrinos and so on. <clears throat> then there are, in blue, are these proposed, uh, sorry, not all of them are proposed. 
the Juno detector is also a liquid scintillator, as I said. Uh, it is supposed to come online in about a year or two uh, from now, and supposed to look at uh, reactor neutrinos almost 50 kilometers away from the reactor. Uh, so this is a big improvement on the earlier set of experiments which were done. Uh, so the Diabe experiment, they were, they were about one and a half kilometers away. This is a more than an order of magnitude farther away, and therefore uh, they have to build a huge detector. But here, uh, they propose to measure the, the mass ordering of the neutrinos using the reactor neutrinos. Okay, so uh, the other detectors proposed are the liquid argon detector, as I said already, these are on the anvil, and uh, they may start taking data in a, another seven to eight years' time. So it will take a long time for them to build it. Right now, they're making a prototype, which is uh, again, a picture of that there later on. And uh, of course, there are also, uh, as I said, uh, detectors to look for, uh, which have already seen coherent neutrino scattering, and other detectors which are hoping to understand more things about uh, coherent neutrino scattering, involving initially uh, cesium iodide, sodium doped, and liquid xenon, and so on, many uh, other kinds of as well. Uh, to detect the okay, next slide. Okay, so this is a picture of the Kamlan detector, which is a uh, one kiloton, 1,000 ton of liquid scintillator. It's in a plastic uh, shell, which is floating inside a buffer oil. And so they have adjusted the densities of these such that this is just floating in the buffer oil. Uh, so, and it's a very thin uh, uh, plastic material which hold, which separates the scintillator from the buffer oil and of course outside of that there is water uh, which is used for vetoing cosmic muons and uh, they made measurements on reactor antineutrinos so uh, Bakal uh, has said that they did uh, a terrestrial measurement of the neutrino parameters which was earlier only possible using solar neutrinos uh, it's a very beautiful idea it so happened that the uh, reactors uh, were about were clustered around a distance of about 180 kilometers from the uh, Kamioka uh, site. And so this enabled, uh, you know, these uh, the, uh, oscillations not to cancel out for the various energies that are there. Uh, so, you know, you have an energy spectrum, uh, but if you have also a spectrum in L, then you, you are in a mess because then you won't find this uh, oscillation signal. But it so happens that the distance is more or less uh, at 180 kilometers. So depending on the energy, you will have an uh, you will have a maximum or a minimum, and that's what they show in one of the graphs here. The top graph shows you a, a survival probability of the electron antineutrino as a function of uh, L by E. As I said, because L is clustered around uh, 180, they could do this. And so then only the only variable is E and they can plot it this way and you can see a very nice oscillation signal. Uh, but they did something more. Uh, even when the reactors were working, uh, they could account for the reactor antineutrino spectrum and there was a very small excess at low energies. However, the error bars were rather large. The first paper published was in 2005 in Nature. Uh, but subsequently when the Fukushima incident occurred, then the reactors in Japan all became off and now they are only sensitive to the uh, geoneutrino signal. And that's what is shown here uh, in blue is what is expected, the total geoneutrino signal. And uh, what is seen is in those, uh, uh, in those data points here, which uh, reasonably well uh, go along with the expectation. So uh, they have measured, for instance, the expected geoneutrino flux to within about uh, 20% or so. Okay. So this is a, actually a byproduct of what uh, was done, what was aimed at initially to measure the actual patterns, but they also measured geo -neutrinos. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, uh, some pictures of a magnetized iron calorimeter, which is uh, already worked and which is, uh, you know, done its job, which I think now the experiment is uh, stopped. Uh, so the uh, accelerator neutrinos come in from, I should go here, from Fermi lab to this mine in Sudan where this far detector is located. But since the flux of these uh, neutrinos or antineutrinos as the case may be of the muon uh, type is not, uh, cannot be uh, estimated very well. So there is also a, something called a near detector. 
and this near detector is basically to normalize the flux so you you, have, you can then take a ratio of the counts that you see as a function of energy in the far detector divided by the near detector of course there are complications when you come to if you want to measure things very precisely then you have to worry about the fact that the opening angle seen in the near detector is much more than that seen by the far detector because the sizes are similar uh, so the energy and angle uh, the angular distribution uh, could be somewhat different so uh, but at least on the uh, on the bulk you get things uh, uh, factored out so they have measured for instance mixing angle theta 2 3 mixing angle the some uh, poor measurement of the theta 1 3 mixing angle where you start off with muon type of neutrinos look for electron type of neutrinos or you uh, have muon neutrinos look for muon neutrinos and you see a shortage at uh, certain energies and so on so these are the kind of measurement that are done so this detector consists of iron plates and scintillator planes so the iron uh, interacts with the neutrino produces uh, muons or electrons in the case maybe and then these traverse the scintillator where you get information on x y and also timing information uh, incidentally that reminds me that, hello somebody should stop uh, somebody should mute their mic there's some music and so on yeah yeah, yeah. Okay. okay i yeah yeah, yeah. okay so uh, as i said there is also timing information and you know the time at which the neutrino started out from the accelerator site and in fact there was a uh, there was a uh, experiment which claimed to have seen faster than light neutrinos uh, the so called opera experiment of course finally they retracted the result they found what was the problem but at a similar time minos also looked at their data and they found no evidence for faster than light neutrinos but this is all using the basic uh, the, the excellent timing of these detectors and the timing time structure of the beam the neutrino beam okay next slide okay this is just a picture of the uh, prototype of the dune liquid argon uh, tpc detector the time projection chamber this uh, has uh, uh, it's a huge detector it's about 1000 ton uh, prototype because their final detector is going to be uh, i think about 17 kiloton and so this is about uh, what 20th of that size and uh, it has uh, the so called as i said field cages there, there are uh, portions of it that Three. They have divided it into three portions for whatever reason, and uh, there is an electric field in each of these. And so, when ionization is produced, when neutrino interacts, produces a charged particle. Then these drift, and uh, there are uh, you know uh, anode uh, at the anode plane, you have layers which will pick up the position information. And uh, importantly, uh, argon also produces scintillation light. So that is also collected at uh, the uh, by the side of the anode. So you have photosensors there. and that provides the t equal to zero signal so with respect to that time you measure the drift time which can be in microseconds several microseconds and so although the detector is slow for uh, perhaps some uh, experiments which have very large count rates for a deep underground experiment this is actually not at all a problem where the count rates are expected to be very low at any uh, so this is something that has already been built in uh, cern and they are actually in the process of uh, characterizing this detector then this will uh, go to uh, fermi lab and of course they'll make uh, bigger versions of this uh, 20 times bigger versions of this uh, i don't know i can't read the last line there was some last line there but okay next slide okay then finally i come to uh, another way of detecting neutrinos namely coherent neutrino scattering uh, what is meant by coherent neutrino scattering <clears throat> this is, again this is explained i should have put it here if the momentum transfer of the elastic uh, neutrino scattering from a nucleus is such that the inverse of that uh, momentum transfer uh, is of the size of, of the order of the size of the nucleus then uh, the neutrino uh, scattering can feel the effect of all the nucleons together and since we know in quantum mechanics when amplitudes add then the signal is proportional to the number of those uh, subunits squared uh, the, the effect is goes like the square so that's how uh, uh, this has the possibility of shrinking the size of neutrino detectors of course you can't do the, all the things that can be done by uh, other detectors for instance as the as the name goes when you have coherent neutrino scattering it means that uh, it's a elastic scattering 
So you don't have the charge current, you don't know what kind of neutral noise is. Uh, if you look at the charge current process, then you can tell what was the uh, electron, uh, whether it was electron neutrino or a neon neutrino or a tau, depending on the final state uh, and your identification of that final state. In this case, uh, it is uh, not sensitive to E, mu or tau. Everything scatters equal. Uh, but this information can be complementary to other kinds of information. For instance, supernova neutrinos, even if they oscillate, you detect this, you, you can uh, get the complete uh, neutrino signal. Uh, this was uh, uh, predicted in about 1974, but it was only detected in 2017. Because uh, although the cross-section increases by about a factor of 100, as I will show in a subsequent slide, detection of this elastic scattering is very difficult. Why? Because although the momentum transfer Q is of the order of uh, MeV by C, or maybe tens of MeV by C, the recoil energy, how can you detect? You can't detect the scattered neutrino. You have to detect the scattered nucleus. And detecting that scattered nucleus, which is recoiling at very low energy, is not at all easy. And uh, however, the uh, coherent uh, collaboration in working at Oak Ridge National Lab at this palation neutron source indeed found a signal for coherent neutrino scattering using just a 15 kg cesium iodide sodium doped scintillation detector. And this was done at just room temperature. So you didn't even, they didn't even need cryogenics to do that. So it's, uh, I mean, if I were to show this size, this is just about this size. It's a small detector. And uh, they could detect these neutrons. Of course, uh, because the source is a pulse source and uh, uh, the energies, uh, cuts can be put and so on, you could measure these things. Uh, this will come in the next slide. Next slide, please. Okay. So uh, on the left is shown, a uh, so-called uh, uh, diagram of what happens when a uh, neutrino scatters elastically. It exchanges, because it's a neutral current process, it exchanges a Z boson. The nucleus recoils uh, recoil momentum of Q. And if this Q is such that Q uh, times the radius of the nucleus is less than or of the order of one, then you can have all nucleons uh, participating. As it turns out, because the, neutro, uh, the neutron comes with a charge of so happens one minus four times sine squared theta uh, Weinberg. So uh, for the proton, this is uh, one. Uh, for sorry, this is close to zero. And for the neutron, it doesn't come in this way, and so it's uh, of the order of one. Okay. So uh, it's mainly neutrons that scatter. But since they're in a heavy nucleus, there are lots of these neutrons. So and since they uh, uh, scatter coherently, uh, on the right is shown a. Uh, this is again taken from the discovery paper uh, which came in science in 2017. Now, uh, in uh, red, they shown the uh, anti-neutrino uh, uh, proton uh, cross-section, the so-called charge current inverse beta decay cross-section uh, as a function of energy of the neutrino. And you can see that the coherent elastic scattering is of the order of 100 times larger okay, because of this coherence. Because uh, cesium iodide, for instance, has each of these, cesium or iodine, whichever it scatters from, is of the order of 50, 60, new, 70 neutrons. So uh, it goes like about a couple of orders of magnitude more uh, in cross-section as compared to that for a single uh, nucleon. Next slide, please. Okay, as I said, so sorry, please remain on this slide. Uh, the, the other thing that I wanted to say is that it's difficult to detect because of the low recoil energies. Invariably, in detectors at low energies, you have a lot of uh, uh, background due to background radioactivity and so on. And gamma rays coming from there, they scatter. So each of these component scattering produces a kind of box-like structure. And the lower in energy go, all these add up. And so at low energies, you have a huge background due to this component scattering of uh, gamma rays from radioactive uh, background, which is there in your surroundings, in the environment. Uh, but of course, they could, uh, they could uh, reduce this by using the uh, time information. So they could use the pulse nature of this, uh, uh, of the spallation neutron source. They are produced only at certain times and they are off. So you can, uh, for the off period, you can measure the background and then subtract it out. That's probably shown in the next slide. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is just shows the layout. Uh, so the proton beam comes in from the left it hits a uh, mercury target. Mercury is, you know, is a liquid at uh, room temperature. And uh, it produces uh, many neutrons. 
typically a GeV uh, uh, proton beam, which uh, is there in SNS, uh, produces about 20 odd uh, neutrons. They're called spallation neutrons. And, uh, but it also produces, since the energy is high, it also produces pions, a few uh, charged pions. And these pions uh, decay with a half-life of typically tens of nanoseconds, uh, 20, 30 nanoseconds. And uh, they lead to muons, and the muons in turn decay into electron and two neutrinos. So it is these neutrinos that are coming out uh, that are finally detected. So in these neutrinos. So the detector in question, which was used here, is this so-called cesium hydride detector. And it was somewhere here at a distance of about 20 meters from the source. But this was in a uh, place where it was well shielded. This alley had lots of concrete uh, above it. Uh, so all the neutrons coming from the beam were uh, shielded very well. Uh, and uh, I mean, the neutrino signal was therefore uh, a little easier to see. Uh, next slide. Next slide, please. Okay. okay. So what is shown here is uh, the uh, reduced data uh, with beam off, uh, 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 giving the number of photoelectrons seen, uh, which can be done through photomultiplier. You can calibrate the photomultiplier for using LEDs and so on, so you know how many photoelectrons. So this is, in this case, given in terms of number of photoelectrons uh, for beam off condition and for beam on condition. So what is plotted is number of photoelectrons and also the arrival times. So uh, as you can see, the energy spectrum corresponds to the is a broad spectrum with a peak around 15 MeV or so, and the arrival of uh, 15 photo sorry 15 photoelectrons or so, not MeV, and uh, the arrival time uh, ranges from uh, say uh, half a microsecond, which is then probably cut off, to about a few microseconds, uh, five to ten microseconds, and that's because the Although the pion decays pretty quickly, the muon has a, a lifetime of about 2.2 microseconds. So you have to wait for about uh, six, 10 microseconds to get the full, signal, full decay signal. But as you can see, uh, the beam off background is pretty low and uh, you know, it can be subtracted out and they have a very clear signal. I think it is something, I, I don't remember the number, but it's some uh, eight or 10 sigma uh, signal. Uh, so in particle physics, a five sigma signal is considered to be necessary if you want to claim that you have a positive effect. And I think this was way beyond that. But I, as I said, I don't remember exactly the number, but it was a very clear signal of uh, coherent uh, scattering. Okay, next slide. Okay, now we come to, uh, how am I doing in, uh, I'm already late, I think, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so uh, uh, the other possibility is, uh, you know, uh, could we do uh, part two in the subsequent edition? Some time to talk to you. Uh, sorry, no, no. Uh, let me first ask uh, Satya's opinion on this. Uh, Satya Narayana, uh, how many? Yeah, uh, I don't know. I can't, see, do you I can't see the number here, but I think there must be another 10, 15 slides. I had about 38, I think, in all. Okay. Uh, so it's probably halfway. You can see the number. At what yeah. slide what number was that? Okay, actually, uh, your uh, um, slides are right up to 37. Yeah, that's right. Okay. So, so I'm at, at which slide right now? You are around. Uh, no, no, beyond this. Coherent neutrino scattering. The last coherent, ah, weighing the neutrino. That's the first slide. Yeah. yeah. What yeah, slide yeah. number is that? 22. 22. So 37, 15. So it's almost one third way more. Okay. So that may be a little too much, right? And yeah, I don't okay. want to skip over it because. I, no, no, we also have to uh, ask for questions. Yeah. Ask for uh, questions. Yeah. So, so therefore, so maybe, maybe uh, we can. Maybe you can do a part two then. Part two of this. Yes. Okay. okay. That, that will be fine. Yeah. Uh, so, thank you. So, the, what I uh, suggest right now is uh, uh, as I announced in the beginning itself, uh, the questions is, uh, are after the question session is after the lecture. So I request the participants who would like to ask questions to raise their hand. Uh, it is there in your uh, control. You can raise your hand and uh, I'll come to know who the person is and then I'll be able to uh, kind of come to you and uh, you know make sure that you ask the question. Yeah, so I'm going to take a question from Suresh Kumar. Uh, yeah, please go ahead. Uh, uh, Vivek, uh, you mentioned, hello. Yeah, yeah, I can hear yeah, you. Yeah, we can hear please you. Go ahead. Please yeah. go 
you mentioned that uh, fortunately uh, once in a lifetime there is a chance probability that it will interact with a human yeah uh, whether fortunately or unfortunately if it interacts <coughs> yeah. what will happen well i mean uh, as i said uh, the neutrino interacts weakly and therefore it's only very rarely that it interacts if that cross section had been much more for whatever reason then we would have been submerged in a sea of neutrinos which is interacting with us and uh, it would be probably not good for us right uh, no that is what i want suppose yeah. suppose a neutrino hits a person yeah interacts what well, is it, it it produces uh, if it's a electron type of neutrino it will produce a electron no no it will the produce type of, whether it yeah, so it will produce it, some ionization but if it no, is no. one uh, it does nothing And yeah, the flux is much much more. Yeah, yeah. If okay. it is too much, then it is like radiation uh, problem, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. correct. So, for as I said, also if you have a flux of very high energy neutrinos, where the interaction cross section is much much higher, then mm -hmm. and an intense source, then uh, you might be in trouble. Exactly. So, yeah, even with neutrinos. No, no. Since trouble. you said, fortunately, that's why I asked. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So that, that yeah. was what was uh, implied. Yeah. so uh, can, can we go to now uh, bala subramaniam uh, please ask your question uh, hi uh, am i audible yes yes uh, hi sir i have some doubt with the geo neutrinos flux yes. which is on slide number 13 or 14 yeah uh, one second 13 or yeah. 14 yeah 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 that that to me kamland yeah i mean yeah. there yeah. you said uh, i mean you explained the geo neutrino flux yeah Uh, I mean, could you? I mean, uh, share any? Uh, I mean, any paper source or research article source for that? Uh, okay, I haven't given the reference here, but uh, uh, I think if you just Google it, uh, there is uh, very recently there is an archive paper by a Smirnov. It's not the same Smirnov uh, who hmm. uh, invented this. Uh, you know, what is what is known by this uh, by that uh, Mikhail Smirnov effect. Not that spinoff. It's another spinoff from Vienna, and uh, that's a, a 2019 archive paper. I don't remember the reference offhand, but if you send me an email at vivek dot data at gmail dot com, I can send you that. Yes, but sir. But you can also Google it. You can look up archive and uh, look for spinoff. I think it's O spinoff. Okay. It's a 2019 uh, paper. Okay. And one more so question. I have references. Okay. I mean, uh, you you are saying about the. Geo neutrinos flux. So th yeah. is this known as the earth matter effect, or I mean? No, 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 no. This is nothing to do with earth matter effect. Okay. These are neutrinos that are produced as a result of beta decays, which are in the cascade of decays when uranium two thirty eight, uh, uranium two thirty five, and thorium two thirty two decay. So each of these nuclei decays by alphas, but then the next step could be a beta decay. So when you have beta decay, then you have an accompanying neutrino, and then again it might be an alpha decay, beta decay, and so on. So whenever there is beta decay there is a neutrino contribution and it is those neutrinos that tell you about how much of uranium thorium is probably there uh, in the crust of the right. earth or maybe in the deep interior of the earth and so on sir one one, one more question about the yeah. south pole ice cube yeah uh, some people in tn they are like believing it is due to the radiation effect uh, the experiment is i mean has been constructed at the south pole i mean could you please shed some light on that no 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 uh this is the only place on earth probably apart from the oceans oh, but oceans have a uh, you know there's a different aspect to oceans uh, this idea was that actually if you take some this uh, ice that is there which is deep uh, maybe i think a few tens of meters and onwards that is even clearer than very pure water water attenuates light which is emitted as a result of cherenkov radiation more Uh, liquid water attenuates light more than this so-called ice, which is uh, compressed uh, due to the upper, uh, you know, ice which is there. Of course, even water uh, doesn't get compressed, but uh, uh, yeah, water also there is a lot of pressure as you go deep down. Uh, but uh, as I said, the main reason is that you can't find a body of ice which is so large, one kilometer cube, and very clean ice. Uh, anywhere else, Arctic, for instance, melts, and you don't have anywhere one kilometer thick uh, ice. Okay, so this is the only place on Earth where you can do it, 
and the uh, you know maximum temperature i think is uh, on the south pole uh, where they are located i think it's something like 9 uh, how many is it so 9000 feet above uh, mean sea level uh, the maximum temperature during summer is i think something like minus 10 degrees centigrade of course when it goes to minimum in winter uh, which is when we have summer uh, peak of summer there it's minus 82 also the lowest recorded temperature is minus 82 degrees centigrade okay. so it's a very harsh environment in which they are functioning but they are doing that only because you have a huge amount of ice that is a natural detector so the way they do it is they sink uh, photomultiplier uh, units they make a string which is maybe 10 20 uh, photomultipliers in one string which is about a kilometer long so they are placed at regular intervals and they are basically looking at the cherenkov light that is emitted by the charged particles created by neutrinos interacting with the ice and so they have actually made measurements of uh, you know tv neutrinos and so you know we know now that there are neutrino sources very high energy neutrino sources uh, placed in our uh, in our universe uh, there is uh, of course uh, closer home in our uh, galaxy we have of course sources but there are also extra galactic sources very high energy so this detector was mainly constructed for looking at uh, very low fluxes of ultra high energy neutrinos to do neutrino astronomy okay but now incidentally they can do other things as well okay sir thank you sir okay uh, then we go to another question uh, by uh, uh, that karkare yeah good evening ha good evening good evening after that sir yes yes bolie i am very happy to hear you hearing for long time a long yeah. gap that is plus yeah. point yeah one question what yeah. is the lowest energy neutrino detected or predicted or possibility lowest energy well uh, a direct detection of a neutrino if you ask okay what is the lowest energy neutrino i think that would be in the region of about um, uh, maybe of the order of 250 or 300 keV so they have been detected by the borexino detector which looks at pp neutrinos so the pp neutrino spectrum so uh, the way uh, the, the first reaction that takes place in the sun the fusion reaction that takes place in the sun in our own sun is p plus p going to deuterium plus positron plus neutrino electron type of neutrino uh, and then if you look at the q values and the temperatures involved you get neutrinos from uh, from zero energy to about 400 uh, 20 keV or so and this uh, uh, orexino detector because it makes use of uh, uh, compton i mean the equivalent of compton scattering in uh, the case of photons so when neutrino scatter of an electron they produce a recoil uh, electron uh, and then that can be measured but because at low energy there are background they, they cannot measure really uh, with any sensitivity neutrinos which are below about uh, 150 to 200 uh, keV so that's roughly the threshold that they have so threshold is 150 to 200 kev yeah but that, that can change i mean with the with the improved technology this could this number could change okay can it be tens of evs theoretically yes, possibility so is, of uh, no but then the required energy goes down no so uh, if let it go down but is yeah. it possible let it go down yeah but then if you have to detect uh, micro electron volt uh, you know things then that will be very difficult no i am not talking about detection today it is yeah. not possible it may be tomorrow or yeah. may not be possible at all doesn't matter uh. theoretically what is the lowest energy need to know well, if somebody if somebody discovers a way of measuring the uh, cosmic big bang neutrinos which are uh, you know the average energy of about a couple of hundred micro electron volts because they are uh, good thank you so micro electron volt so also is a possible method you whoever discovers will get a nobel prize i'm sure all right we are not has been on the anvil now for many many years and uh, of course cosmic microwave background had been detected in the 60s but uh, neutrinos no not yet uh, okay i'm not okay. talking about the detection talking about the possibility you yeah. told you on a micro electron volt is a possibility or predicted i mean big bang yeah. should be around yeah uh, good so okay. uh, any missing energy due to physical activity can be attributed to neutrinos not detected at not detectable yet any missing energy well, it depends i mean you have to look at the process and if there is a case for 
having a neutrino take i mean uh, the energy going through neutrinos then maybe you can do that but uh, one can't uh, have a general thing that okay if there is missing energy it must be neutrino so that is not possible uh, so yeah i got a wrong thing to do yeah yeah, I got it, sir, but there could be a possibility. Uh, we have to investigate it. Thank you. Yeah. Sir, question yeah. yours, sir. We I'm will uh, go to uh, Debashish. He has a question. Yeah. Debashish. Debashish, are you there? <coughs> Debashish. Okay, so I will come back, but uh, I also saw. Uh, so, it shows two participants raise their hand. So, yeah, yeah, I'll come pass. to you. And uh, Sadasiv, <coughs> Sadasiv, do you have a question? Yes. Good evening, sir. Actually, I heard that question for the cosmic microwave bag uh, Newton, uh -huh. and uh -huh. he yeah. answered it. So, okay. okay. Also, I thought you had some question last week. So, not last week. Yeah, last week. Uh, on YouTube by the time we close the session. I don't remember. Uh, uh, actually, that question was uh, for the uh, accelerator-based neutrinos, the anti-neutrino uh -huh. and anti-neutrinos. Uh -huh. uh, if we consider the deep inelastic scattering, the, the ratio of neutrino to anti-neutrino, it is about 3. So all this calculation is done by taking no, consideration no, no, of sorry, neutrino. Sir. No, no, what is 3 you said? The differential uh, scattering cross-section ratio. Oh, cross-section ratio. Uh, is it a factor of 3 or is it a factor of 2? I thought it's about a factor. Oh, if we consider if it is a, uh, more than sub GV region, then it is factor yeah. of 2. There okay. we consider the factor of 2. Oh. So all those calculations are done in terms of uh, direct nature. Yeah. But uh, where the uh, NDBD experiment, all those are done in MEV region energy. Mm -hmm. So if NDBD result is positive, then it will say that the neutron and anti neutron are uh, myron in nature. Yeah. So. Uh, my question was, does yeah. those uh, new, uh, Dirac nature or Myrona nature depends uh, upon... No, I, I don't think that will matter because uh, basically uh, it is the helicity of the neutrino and its interaction with the uh, quarks, which also will have a certain uh, chirality associated with them. That is what comes into play and that is what contributes to this factor of, uh, and also the weak charge. Okay, so all these three factors come in. So uh, the fact that it's a Myrona doesn't mean that uh, okay the particle is its own antiparticle but the neutrino that is emitted in a beta minus decay okay will be uh, let's see will be right handed and uh, similarly uh, the other way around if it is emitted in beta plus or in electron capture so it is the helicity that is i think coming into play not so much the nature of the particle okay sir uh, is that fine? Uh, I would like to go back and see if uh, Debashish is Debashish there. Okay. Debashish, are you there? Okay. Uh, if not, uh, then there is another question from somebody. Somebody is saying hello in the background. Ah, uh, is here. Uh, okay, so you can go ahead. Yeah. Uh, regarding this uh, low energy, very low energy uh, neutrinos, yeah, I yeah. think uh, possibility only was asked uh, and possibility may be there, but yeah. probably because of threshold of detecting and I, I don't know whether theoretically about anything is said about cross-section. If cross-section like neut uh, neutron, it is a huge and the detection probability is very small, or maybe detection threshold is a problem, then uh, one can think of that. Whether cross-section is very used for the low energy, theoretically? No, so the, okay. So the uh, de Broglie wavelength goes down, of course, as the energy goes down, but then the interaction cross-section also goes down. So, so, the, goes down. Uh, so, so that goes also down like E squared. And the de Broglie wavelength the, at very low energies in case of non-relativistic, uh, the Broglie wavelength goes like uh, momentum, and so lambda squared goes like uh, e squared, which goes like e. So actually, there is a e factor which is unfavorable. That is one part of it, but also uh, it seems to be at least nobody has a very good idea of how to detect these, uh, yeah. except perhaps using uh, their gravitational interaction. But on the other hand, if you use the uh, or or maybe the in some domain. Uh, if it is possible to have um, 
let's say a, um, a coherent scattering which mimics the gravitational effect and that turns out to be more than the gravitational effect because of course we know that dark matter would also interact gravitationally so some people have been talking about possibly using a what is that uh, a, a, a pendulum uh, yeah. a toroidal pendulum to uh, and have two halves which have different uh, materials in them but equal masses so uh, coherent scattering on one is different from coherent scattering in the other so uh, with a six month cycle or actually a one year cycle uh, the earth is plowing through the sea of neutrinos one way and the other way uh, six months later so you can try to look for this coherent scattering effect on a sensitive gravitational detector gravity based detector no, my, my so I've talked about that, but uh, I think nothing really has uh, fortified because apparently I, I did talk to somebody in uh, thus such things, and uh, it is still many many orders of magnitude uh, below the sensitivity. No, I just I just uh, it happens that I thought whether like neutron, yeah, if low energy has a huge cross section, then uh, some story can be different. No, no. So so the neutron has a cross section for a very different reason. Okay. Yeah. So neutron has a cross section because it can the energy might match with a resonance in a nucleus, and therefore you can resonantly enhance, and so that resonant factor is of order one, and then it's only pi lambda cross squared or uh, factor multiplying that. So and then some spin factor and so. On. So thank you. It's a good yeah, feedback. You have a weak interaction coming. The, the coupling is coming in, so that that makes it more difficult. So you can of course think of perhaps radioactive targets like maybe tritium or something. In which you have a final state with just two bodies, and perhaps think of it, but then it involves huge amounts of tritium. Uh, tritium, and we know what are the difficulties of using a tritium target. I will take, uh, tell about that in the next uh, okay. uh, lecture. Sir, uh, yeah. there is one last question from once again uh, Balasubramaniam. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I hope this is a short question. Uh, please ask quickly. Yes, sir, sir, could you please tell tell me something about the earth matter effect? I mean, we, can we do only through June and T2K experiment, or also whether the ice cube and Baikal also? Uh, I mean, they could also study the earth matter effect. Could you please tell? Us? Okay, I, as I said, in I had some slides later uh, later on on the so-called earth matter effect, and the earth matter effect uh, arises because the as I said, the electron type of neutrinos can interact with the electrons in the matter that it uh, encounters and at certain energies uh, it is possible that there are resonant uh, enhancements of the oscillation phenomena so if you started out with a small mixing angle for instance theta 1 3 uh, one of the mixing angles is small but if you are on resonance this mixing angle can become maximal it can become 45 degrees and uh, so that is the effect of this earth matter effect uh, so of course you have to go to those densities uh, and for instance, those densities are responsible for uh, converting electron type of neutrinos to muon or tau type in the sun when the electron type of neutrino from the core traverses the sun uh, matter or the plasma that we can call it. Densities are pretty high, and some places you can have this. Now, your question was uh, both the experiments T2K and Dune. Yeah, so the T2K would have uh, is a very small, uh, I mean, baseline experiment. Uh, only about 250 kilometers so it is actually basically just going on the crust of the earth so the densities are pretty low there I and mean, density of five six and so on is not uh, good enough for such uh, resonances to occur unless the energies are extremely high so which is not the case in the case of uh, so so such a uh, but there'll be a very small matter effect very tiny on the other hand in the dune experiment because it is going through more dense matter there is a bigger uh, effect of the matter on this, uh, not leading to the resonance. Resonance uh, effects cannot be seen unless you actually almost traverse the diameter of the earth. Okay, and sir. then you encounter very high densities in the core. So okay. none of these detectors. So actually our uh, sort of USP uh, for INO is that we will be able to, for the first time, measure the so-called uh, Mikhail Smirnov Wolfenstein resonance effect okay. uh, due to matter. Okay, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, sir. So, with that, uh, I mean, I don't see any more uh, questions. So, I would like to uh, thank uh, Professor uh, Dathar and also all of you who have uh, uh, very actively participated in Sutas meeting.
So as we know, since um, uh, the talk actually, I mean, could not be finished as he has come prepared. So we will definitely have another uh, part two of this lecture, and you will hear about this in the regular uh, social media channels when it will be scheduled. Uh, but until then, uh, we will have uh, on Wednesday, uh, Professor Amol Dige is going to speak, and on uh, Friday, Subhavati from PRL is going to speak. Uh, that is the schedule for this week, right? And of course, there will be again of three lectures in the coming week. Uh, what I is the timing? Timing? All are at six o'clock. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so uh, before I end, I also want to a little bit apologize uh, for the fact that there was some technology challenge in uh, live streaming this uh, in YouTube, but uh, we have recorded uh, the entire talk. Uh, right after this uh, we finish the session, I'm going to upload it to YouTube for those of you or your friends who have missed the talk, you can share the message to them. So with that, again, uh, uh, Satya, before you close, let me also put in my word of apology. Yeah, yeah. I, I thought I had uh, not a very large number of slides, but on the other, other hand, uh, yeah. I took some time in explaining some of these slides and uh, for a general audience. And so maybe uh, my uh, planning went a little haywire. So I could only do about two thirds or so, or maybe a little more than half. And so, anyway, there's a, I hope there is a next time where uh, this other part can be talked about. Doctor, you are uh, too humble. It is a good sign of a scientist. <laughs> you are humble. We are very happy with you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So, okay then, everybody, uh, thank you. Good night and uh, take care. And uh, hope to see you all back on Wednesday at 6. Well, thank you. Okay. <clears throat>